So my journey to movement as medicine began at a small liberal arts college in Southern California. As the declaration of my major drew closer, I approached my advisors in my two favorite departments, neuroscience and dance, about the idea of me double majoring. They said I probably wouldn't be able to finish both. So I went and did just that. My senior dance piece was thematically based on the connections between brain cells called synapses, and my neuroscience thesis proposed the study of mirror neurons in dancers. With degrees in hand, I wondered how I could continue marrying art and science without an inevitable separation. Do a PhD in neuroscience with dance classes on the side, or pursue a professional performing career and wonder what I took all those chemistry classes for. I will be forever grateful to some wise mentors for steering me to a healing profession in which I could continually draw upon both art and science. So now that you know where my movement medicine journey has landed, I have a question for you, a rhetorical question, of course. When you think of physical therapy, what comes to your mind? Is it a chipper person in green scrubs who came into your hospital room the day after you had surgery and made you get out of bed and go walk down the hall? Or was it someone who came to your elderly parents' house after their hip replacement and made sure that they knew how to get up and down the stairs safely? Or perhaps someone who poked their deceptively strong fingers into your tender muscles and then expected you to memorize 13 exercises to do three times a day. Physical therapists are often identified by what we do, but what I'd like to share with you today is the framework behind why we do what we do and why it matters. So I'll start with the American Physical Therapy Association's 2013 vision for the physical therapy profession. Transforming society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. Wow, sounds pretty important, doesn't it? Transforming society, easier said than done. So Let's start with the relatively easy part, optimizing movement. So how do we optimize movement? Well, first we need to start with evaluating movement, evaluating something called the movement system. Then we can implement movement-related interventions, and we do that to help you maximize your ability to engage with your environment to improve your quality of life. So whether this be anything from playing with your grandchildren to going to school and being able to participate in PE class or finally running that 5K or even something like doing the dishes. All of those things, if they matter to you, they matter to us. But before we talk any further about that, I think it's important that we talk a little bit more about what the movement system is. So the movement system is the integration of body systems that generate and maintain movement at all levels of bodily function. Human movement is a complex behavior within a specific context, and it's influenced by social, environmental, and personal factors. Sounds like a... Uh, uh, complicated <laughs> integrated definition. So I think uh, like our um, profession's vision, let's break this down a little bit further. So let's talk first about the integration of body systems that generate and maintain movement. So we think of the movement system much like we think of any of these other body systems. So I'm sure you're familiar with at least one of these body systems. And this is just a partial list of the body systems that can impact movement. So I thought it'd be helpful to give you some examples. So for the cardiovascular system, uh, can your heart and your blood vessels get enough oxygen through your blood to your tissues um, so that your leg muscles can help you climb the stairs? 
um, the pulmonary system. Do you get short of breath now after staying home for over a year when you walk home carrying all your groceries? The musculoskeletal system, pretty obvious one for us as PTs. One example would be if there is torn cartilage in your shoulder and that makes it too painful to wash your hair. The neurological system or the nervous system, is your brain receiving the correct signals from your feet? so that you can balance when you're walking on cobblestone streets while you're on your European vacation, if only. The integumentary system, is there scar tissue from an old surgery that's limiting your ability to do your backstroke in the pool? So a physical therapist will examine these body systems in the context of how they help generate and maintain movement. So Talking about all of those systems and how they impact movement sounds like there could be, could spend hours and hours examining those systems in the context of movement. So we need some framework upon which we can draw in, in order to um, you know, really get to the root of, of how we're trying to help someone. So one possible framework that a physical therapist may use is called the movement screen. And the movement screen is a tool designed to detect movement impairments that we observe during functional tasks and activities. And I liken this to when you go to the dentist and they take x-rays and they look at your gums to see how much they are or aren't receding. They look at your teeth, they look at your old fillings, and then they clean your teeth. So they're essentially doing maintenance and they're doing so in a somewhat standardized way, no matter who the person is in front of them. So that's sort of what the movement screen is. So it, it's a way for us to decide where we see some issues that would warrant further tests or measures. And the great thing about this is that it's designed to be used for all populations and in all settings. So before we talk about it any further, let's go into what is included on the movement screen. So first item that is included is head movement. So can you look up at the sky? Can you look down at the floor? Can you turn to look over both shoulders? And then can you bring your ear to either shoulder? Pretty straightforward. The next item is changing and maintaining your body position. So this little list here is a variety of ways in which we would change our body position throughout a typical day. Rolling, <clears throat> going from lying down to sitting and vice versa going from sitting to standing and vice versa, and squatting, whether that's to pick something up, set something down, or anything in between. Also important to look at is not just the change in those positions, but those positions themselves, lying on your back, lying on your stomach, lying on your side, sitting in a chair, sitting with your legs out in front of you, standing, and then squatting as well. So then we start to look at mobility or being able to get from A to B. And you'll notice there's items included here that are meant to be inclusive of, of pretty much anybody at any age. So crawling, something we often don't do after the first year of life, uh, walking, running, propelling oneself in a wheelchair if you're non-ambulatory, and then also transversing through vertical space. So can you step up or step down, go up an incline, down a decline? Lastly, there's hand and arm use. <clears throat> so are you able to reach, reach up overhead, behind you, out to the side, across your body, up your back? Are you able to grasp objects? So if you think about the amount of times you grip or grasp something in your day, cooking, cleaning, opening a door, can you manipulate objects in your hand? So this is where it gets a little bit more into fine motor. Can you, um, <clears throat> can you write? Can you type? Can you text? So all of these things are things that encompass what a typical person would do um, functionally during their day. Now, we don't 
look only at yes or no, only at whether or not this person can effectively do these things, but what does it look like when they do them? So this is a list of some elements we may look at when somebody is doing the items on the movement screen. So the speed of their movement, maybe you can go from sitting to standing on your own, but it takes you 30 seconds just to do that. We look at the amount of movement. So maybe you can reach overhead, but you can only reach to the middle cabinet and not the top shelf. We also look at symmetry. So one of my favorite um, quotes to say to patients are, everyone's a little bit asymmetrical. So asymmetries in general are normal, but when they are either excessive or they're related to someone's functional impairment, we may look at symmetry. So for example, um, I can bend both of my knees. One knee can bend a little less than the other, but I can effectively do anything I want. So that's a, an example of a natural or normal asymmetry versus um, I can bend both my knees, but one of my knees only bends about halfway. And that's making it really hard for me to go up and down the stairs. So that's not a symmetry that um, we would consider to be um, optimal. Then there's control. So um, this encom encompasses a whole lot of different qualities of movement. So smoothness of movement, stability, that's a big one, particularly as we talk about um, people in older age. So maybe I can reach all the way overhead, but when I do so, that requires a shift of my body weight that I cannot sustain, and then I'm at risk of falling if I do that. And then there's also time-based qualities, so initiation or sequencing of the movement we're doing. So maybe I have the amount of motion I need to go up the stairs, but by the time I move my leg forward to place it on the step, I haven't flexed my hip up enough, and thus I am catching my toe on the step. So that would be an example of, of a sequencing or a timing issue. Last but not least, symptoms. So this is a pretty obvious one. And a lot of the reason why somebody's going to come to see us in physical therapy is, sure, I can reach overhead, but boy, that hurts. Or sure, I can walk to the grocery store to get my groceries, but I'm exhausted and it takes all of my energy for the day to do that. So as straightforward as the movement screen may seem, it's important to remember that all of these movements that we've just gone over and all of those qualities, those don't occur in a vacuum. So movement is influenced significantly by social, environmental, and personal factors. And these are things that we consider um, heavily when we are seeing someone in physical therapy. So what are some examples of how these factors could influence movement? So socially, maybe you're expected, your workplace is fairly formal and you're expected to wear dress shoes to work. And those dress shoes have been squeezing your feet or putting a lot of strain on the bottoms of your feet. And that's been causing you some pain and problems even when you're not wearing those shoes on the weekend. Environmental. I'm sure many of you, as including myself, have had to adapt to remote work over the last year plus, or you know somebody that's had to do that, or somebody in your household has had to do that. And for many of us, we didn't necessarily have all the proper equipment that we needed in order to do that in an ergonomic way. And so we've had to adapt certain postural and movement habits in order to work within our given environment that we didn't have to do before. And uh, I can attest to that a large part of my day is spent helping people to some degree navigate some of these issues that have come up over the last year. Lastly, personal. So personal factors can play just as large of a role as social or environmental. And 
there could be a lot of personal and I would include em emotional factors that are involved here. So one example I see fairly often is somebody has adopted a repetitive posture or a postural habit, maybe one that's a little bit slouched or slumped. And that can be for a variety of personal reasons. Um, one of which could be this person is um, working in an environment or going to school where they're having a lot of anxiety or a lot of um, social anxiety. And that's their the posture that they adapt because of that. Or for people who have larger breasts and um, they're either trying to minimize that or um, it's actually just an impact of um, some strain to their body. So our movement choices can also impact these same factors in the opposite direction. So we can use movement to have an impact on any of these areas. So for example, socially, we may decide to give a really firm handshake to a potential client at work because we want to convey that we are strong and confident and that they should be confident in us. We might um, be at uh, the audience of a game show and we stand up on our tiptoes and stretch our arm up as high as we can so that we're, we're the next contestant picked. Or when we get home from work and um, our spouse is with us and they notice that we go from having this really rigid, tense looking posture to a more relaxed posture. And that could communicate that we've finally relaxed, um, such as after, you know, giving, giving a lecture to an invisible audience. <laughs> so the last point I wanna make about the movement system is that human movement is a complex behavior and it's within a specific context. And what I hope you may be starting to think about in talking about those social, environmental and um, personal factors is that movement is, is a lot more than just a physical means to an, a functional end. In fact, one of the ways that I have thought about movement across my education and career is that Movement is, is the language of the body. It's the way that we communicate. And we can communicate through movement either directly, such as if I wave at you to get your attention, um, or indirectly, such as that posture example. Relaxed posture means that I'm relaxed. And movement is, is really the way for us to express ourselves. And that expression, um, even when it doesn't look creative, in my perspective, it is all creative because it is all original. It is all an adaptation and a response to our environment. And it's, it's all expressive. So when we evaluate movement as a form of expression, um, a physical therapist really looks at movement and is a movement expert when movement is primarily for function. Although, of course, nothing is nothing fits in discrete categories. So we primarily look at it as function, although expression does play a role. However, there's, there's a profession called a dance and movement therapist. And a dance and movement therapist is an expert for when movement is for expression. So I'd like to share with you this clip of a dance and movement therapist going through how they evaluate movement. So the million dollar question is, well, how do dance and movement therapists objectively observe and assess movement? Many dance and movement therapists utilize Rudolf Laban's system of movement analysis that breaks down movement into its basic component parts. Developed by Laban in the early 1900s, this taxonomy is used in various fields of study, including but not limited to dance, theater, industrial work study, and physical education, not to mention within the field of DMT. Laban's taxonomy provides dance and therapists with an objective framework and language from which one can describe, assess, and create movement interventions. We also use this tool to become aware of our own personal preferences and prejudices so that we are better equipped to keep them in check within the therapeutic relationship. 
Laban's taxonomy consists of four interrelated categories, body, effort, space, and shape. By using Laban's taxonomy, we can answer a series of questions about movement so that we may intervene on this nonverbal level to help our clients meet their goals and improve their overall health and well-being. So body asks the question, what part is moving? That would be my arm. Effort asks the question, how is it moving? That would be quickly. Space asks the question, where is it moving? This is right side high and I move up my vertical plane. And shape asks the question, why am I moving? And that would be to get your attention. The answers to the questions of what, how, where, and why are mostly objective and are based on the skilled lens of the observer therapist. The answers are also what dance movement therapists use as their primary tool for intervention and assessment because we believe that movement meets a need, whether functional or expressive. We also believe that, that movement is an outward expression of one's internal world. From this analysis, the dance movement therapist creates movement interventions to join his or her client in their nonverbal expression in order to build therapeutic, empathic, trusting relationships, to understand his or her movement patterns and develop a treatment plan and course of action, to facilitate the development of a broader movement vocabulary in order to improve overall healthier body, mind, and spirit. So sounds pretty similar, I think. Um, she mentioned that they evaluate movement and then they implement movement-based interventions. It's just from a different lens and looking at movement for expressive purposes. And in general, to, to be a little more literal, you know, physical therapist is going to work primarily with um, physical ailments, whereas in general, a dance and movement therapist um, is, is going to see patients who have um, issues that are more along the, the mental and emotional spectrum. Although, again, I think these things are never discrete. There's always some overlap. So she mentioned something um, that was the framework upon which a dance movement therapist is going to evaluate movement. So I wanted to introduce that to you all. So the framework that she mentioned is called Laban Movement Analysis. And Laban movement analysis is similar to the movement screen, but it's for movement that serves an expressive purpose. So <clears throat> Laban movement analysis was originally developed by someone called Rudolf Laban, who's pictured there looking very studious. And Rudolf Laban was a Hungarian dancer, choreographer, performer, uh, scholar, and he developed this system for describing the expression of movement. And it served as a tool to not only observe and evaluate movement expression, but also to document it. And though it was originally developed in the context of performing arts and dance, it actually has been used, as the speaker mentioned, in evaluation of industrial work environments and in other contexts as well. So I wanted to share um, a very brief crash course in Laban movement analysis. And this is something that I studied briefly when um, I was at Pomona College getting my undergrad degree in, in dance. And um, actually, there were two tracks to the dance major at Pomona. One was actually called movement studies and the other was called performance studies. And while I went the performance studies route because I, I wanted to perform and I wanted to choreograph and have that creative aspect, um, I actually took some of the coursework from the movement studies track. And this was, this was part of that coursework because I, I wanted to get deeper into evaluating movement and looking at some of the the hows and whys behind movement, whether or not it's for uh, in a dance piece or in everyday life. So Laban movement analysis is structured around these 
four components that the speaker mentioned. And it's developed based on the definition of movement that is, it is a pattern of change that occurs in these four components, body, effort, space, and shape. Let's start with body, perhaps the most simple and um, least uh, esoteric, pardon the term woo-woo of the four components. So body is, as the speaker described, what is moving? Um, so this component is, is not unlike a large part of our movement screen. So it describes the body parts and their actions. And it includes some of the same qualities that a physical therapist might examine. So the initiation and the sequencing of movement. It looks at patterns. And although I have not necessarily seen, I have seen group physical therapy, but I don't know that I've seen um, physical therapy in the context of two bodies connecting, to some degree, we do look at that at times when we are training a partner or a caregiver to assist in a person's care. The second component to lob on movement analysis is effort. So effort describes the how of somebody moving. And effort is what we observe when we think about the mover's intention attitude, energy, and it can be broken down further into these four factors. Weight, which is the impact of the mover on the world. Space, which is how the mover orients attention to the environment. Time, which is um, how the mover does or does not have a sense of urgency, and flow, which um, is the mover's attitude or use of bodily control. So these definitions are starting to be a, a little less tangible than in the body component. So let's break this down a little bit further into each of these four factors has two opposite or polar elements. And so each, each factor, you can describe movement as one of its two elements or anywhere in between. So here's a, a semi-confusing, though clear when you go through it, diagram of the four effort factors with their two opposite elements per factor. So starting with the weight element. So remember, weight is the impact of the mover or the movement on the world. So the vertical line, the vertical axis there has the weight elements. And you can have light weight or strong weight or anywhere in between. Then we had the um, space elements. So space is the Z axis, the upper right corner that says indirect and direct. So space can be either indirect or direct, or anywhere in between. Time are these floating elements um, underneath the horizontal axis. So time can be described as sustained or sudden, or more simply, slow or quick. Lastly, flow. So flow is the horizontal axis. And flow, if you remember, is the amount of bodily control over the movement. So flow can be free, or it can be bound or anywhere in between. So to recap, weight can be light or strong, and that's the impact on the world or the environment. Space can be indirect or direct, and that's the movement attention to the environment. Um, time can be sustained or sudden or slow or quick. And flow or the amount of control over the movement can be free or bound. Confused yet? It's gonna get a little more complicated. <laughs> so according to lab on movement analysis, movement is is often we have these four we have these four factors, each of which has two elements, yet movement is often can be described by a combination of two or more of these factors. So for example, we don't often move with the time factor being slow or sustained without being able to use 
any of the other factors to describe the movement as well. So according to Laban, a, a combination of all four factors and also just one factor is rare. Most movement is described best by a combination of either two or three factors. So when, when movement can be described by a combination of two factors, let's say weight and time, they, he broke those down further into states. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about states, but some of the states, the names of those states are things like the awake state, the dreamlike state, distant, near, stable, labile. So again, these are combinations of two factors where these two factors best describe the, the state of the movement. So we have states. We also have drives, and drives are the most well-known of the effort combinations. So drives are when a movement can be described by three of the four factors. And these drives are, there's a lot of them, but there's one drive in particular um, that I'm going to go into in more detail. So here's just four examples of four of the drives. So the action drive, the passion drive, the spell drive, the vision drive. Some of these, the names make a little bit of sense to me. For example, um, the spell drive. So if you think of somebody in a spell, right, there's no time factor used to describe the spell drive. If you think of somebody in a spell, it's kind of like timeless, but kind of frozen. So kind of makes sense. The drive that is the most studied and the most used and the most taught, particularly in the performing arts world, is the action drive. So the action drive are movements called actions that are described by different trios of the weight, space, and time elements. So the action drive has no flow, so to speak. Um, so here are the four, sorry, the eight action drives. So the, the action drive uses weight, space, and time. And if you think of having, we've got three factors, each of which have two different elements. We come up with eight combinations, okay? So these are the eight combinations, and these are all different actions, and they've all been named. Um, so we're, rather than going through these one by one, there's actually a great video of somebody demonstrating all eight actions within the action drive. And as you watch this, I want you to think about what she's doing, and she's actually put these to music as well, which that adds a whole other element. And I think she picked this music. This isn't part of Laban movement analysis, but think of what comes up for you, either words or images or emotions as you watch her go through these eight actions and relate them to the name of the action. And then we'll go through that um, in a little bit more detail.
I thought she actually did a great job picking the music. I thought that really added a nice element. Um, okay. So now it's your turn. I can't see any of you, but you can see me. So I I'll, will go on good faith that you're trying some of these yourself. Um, I'm just going to use my hands, but these, these action drives and efforts can be done with any body part. So um, let's kind of chalk through these. So first one is gliding. So gliding is light, direct, and sustained. So gliding could be something like this. So sustained, definitely. Direct, getting from point A to point B. Um, and light as well. Pressing is almost like gliding, but instead of being light, it's strong. So come back to the idea of weight being the impact on the world. So how I would interpret that would be um, instead of my gliding, I would still be sustained and direct, but I might do something like this. Okay, so a little bit of a heavier impact on my impact right now is on the air, but if I were to use my legs or if I were to be contacting another person, that could be seen maybe a little bit more clearly. Next is floating. So floating is we're still sustained, so we're still kind of slow. We're light, like gliding, but instead of being direct, we are indirect. So floating could look something like this. Okay. So slow, indirect, and still light. And then from there, we have ringing. So ringing almost exactly like floating. It's slow, it's indirect, but it's stronger. So in that way, it's a bit like pressing, but just with an indirect pathway. So ringing could be something like this. And here's where we get into some of these next drives are the word is actually an action functionally. So it's really easy to think about ringing, right? Just like you would ring up, ring a towel. And so if you think about a slow ringing, that is definitely indirect and it's definitely strong. Next is dabbing. So here's where we start to get into the quick actions. So dabbing, <clears throat> like gliding, is direct and it's light, but it's quick. So whereas our gliding was something like this, our dabbing would be something like this. Okay. Okay. Next we have punching. So punching, very similar to dabbing, although it's strong, and very similar to pressing, but it's quick. And again, here's another uh, functional action word. So a quick, direct, and strong, of course, could be like this, but it doesn't have to be an actual punch. It could be something like this, okay? Which, if you look down at the end of the list, slashing, this might be something you would do if you were thinking of slashing, but the difference between punching and slashing so that's the indirectness, indirect pathway there. So that's flashing. And then going back up to the second to last one, flicking. So I think of flicking is really similar to dabbing. It's quick, it's light, but it's indirect. Okay, so dabbing, flicking. Hopefully you humored me and went through those. So I wasn't doing them by myself, but you're welcome to do them later on or show them to your family or your cat. All right, so all of that was under the umbrella of effort. So remember, we go back to Laban said movement occurs in four components. Body is the what is moving. Effort is the how it moves. Third component is space. So space is the where of movement. So Laban described space often in the concept of what he called the kinesphere, and that's a picture of him standing inside a life-size kinesphere. So the kinesphere to me is, I picture the, um, 
the Da Vinci Man and how it's a person in the center and there's some points on the outside. So the Kinesphere is supposed to represent the volume defined by the reaching possibilities of the limbs. So all those points of the kinosphere that um, you see in that picture, those are, if he stands perfectly in the center, those are all the ways in which he could reach his limbs. Um, so the, the kinosphere helps us describe um, motion and connection with the environment in terms of if we are reaching far in the far reach space, which we would use a large movement to reach for the far reach space. If we're moving um, close to ourselves, um, we might be moving in the near reach space or somewhere in between in the mid reach space. Laban also defined different zones in the kinosphere in which movement can occur. So he defined moving up, moving down, moving forward, moving backward, moving to the side, open, and to the side, across. So side open, meaning that you're not going across your body, and side across, meaning you're going across um, the midline of your body. And there was some description, too, that, that was pretty similar to how we think of the three-dimensional plane. So the vertical plane, the horizontal plane. So the last component of the four component, components of movement, according to Laban, is shape. And shape is the why of movement. So the speaker in the video described this component as if, if they're doing this, that the why would be to get your attention. So this is a little bit of where Laban probably deviates most from how we look at movement in the context of physical therapy and movement for function is this is where the why gets a little bit more towards um, the creative aspect. So um, the why he described in terms of form, which are actually similar to talking about postures that we may look at. So those ones we went over earlier, those positions, lying down, standing, sitting. Um, he described shape in terms of modes, so ways of relating to the environment, and then probably the most easy to understand or simple to understand are qualities. So qualities are how the body changes when it goes towards a point in space. So um, is the body closing or opening? And these qualities can occur in all three planes of motion. So again, we have another excellent demonstration of some of the shape qualities. Let's take a look at that. So these shape qualities are where we're starting to get into pretty descriptive language that, that is conveying, um, is communicating some sort of intention. So, um, and, and I think some of these, like the rising and sinking, that's movement in the vertical plane. Spreading and closing is in the horizontal plane, and then um, advancing and retreating in the sagittal plane. So while it's not language we would use in physical therapy or in a profession where we look at movement for function, um, they can be related to how we look at movement um, in the three-dimensional plane. So <clears throat> to tie this all together, whether we're moving for function or we're moving for expression, movements are a way to engage with the world. And it's a way 
to connect with those around us. And as Laban believed, it's what makes us human. So quote from Laban, the purpose of life, as I understand it, is a care for the human as opposed to the robot, a call to save mankind from dying out in hideous confusion, an image of a festival of the future, a mass of life in which all the celebrants in communion of thought, feeling, and action seek the way to a clear goal, namely to enhance their own inner light. Movement can be used to heal the mind and the body. And I'd like to leave you tonight with a few firsthand examples. Hey, I'm Katie. This is my story, how dance movement therapy helps me in my recovery from my eating disorder. Dance movement therapy is a way to connect with your body and emotions through movement. A lot of the time, you don't use words, just your body. I've been battling my eating disorder for three years. Some people think an eating disorder is about being skinny or that people choose to have it. But an eating disorder comes in many forms and for many reasons. For me, it began when I started running. I wanted to be healthy and strong, and running helped me quiet the overwhelming thoughts and feelings. But after some time, something just switched in my head, and it became an unhealthy obsession. I became a compulsive exerciser and restrictor. My mind gradually had me portioning out less and less. I became hyper-focused on my exercise routine and eating regimen. All that mattered was completing my reps in a strict time limit at the same time every day. It was a schedule in my mind. Any deviation from my routine really ticked me off. I missed out on a lot of life because I was so much in my own head and didn't know how to let go. I developed body dysmorphia which is like looking in a funhouse mirror, but you don't know that it's not real. I was disconnecting from my body, and I no longer had a relationship with myself. First, I met Erin, the dance movement therapist at Children's Hospital Colorado. Mostly, I worked with Erin one-on-one. Erin wanted me to learn to let my body do what it wanted to do instead of what I was making it do. But it was awkward at first, and I was overwhelmed. I had low self-confidence, and I did not think I was a good dancer. Not a good dancer, this is overwhelming, too much food, I feel awkward. These thoughts were like a running dialogue in my mind, almost paralyzing. I felt like I couldn't do it, like I didn't have control. No one understood. I felt so alone. Erin had me push against a wall, and we played tug of war. This allowed me to release my pent up energy and to discover what I was really feeling. I learned that I'm aggressive and defensive to protect myself from getting hurt. If the wall comes down, then I'm vulnerable and scared. It's hard to let people in and entrust so much of yourself to other people. It helped me to have a way to express myself without words. There's so much going on in my head that there's no way I can get it all out with words. Dance movement therapy sometimes is about stillness too. One day, I talked to my heart and apologized for all the torment I put it through. Erin did a body tracing. I identified emotions where I felt them in my body, filling in different areas with different shapes and colors. Sometimes Erin had me release my tension through weighted blankets and deep pressure. There are highs and lows in recovery and therapy, just as there are highs and lows in life. Dance movement therapy helped me get through the good times and the bad. Dance movement therapy helped me connect with myself and with others. Dancing freely allowed me to feel more comfortable with myself. I 
I began to see myself clearly, but at times I still struggle. So when I feel fear, tension, and aggression, I dance it out! Dance movement therapy gave me a wider perspective. It allows me to go from here to here. Focusing on the cool moves detaches me from negative thoughts and interrupts the looping in my brain. Before, I was scared of the future, and I didn't look forward to it. It felt like one big obligation. Now I'm excited about the future. Dance movement therapy has improved my relationships because I'm no longer afraid to be honest with people. Honesty strengthens your connections to others. Dance movement therapy has given me a healthy outlet. It allows me to be free. So now we have a brief example from the physical therapy lens. Being a soccer player is my identity. So when I hurt my knee, a lot of my identity, I felt as if was shattered. It really humanizes you because as a professional athlete, you're somewhat of a, of a freak. And this injury really brings you back down to earth. You're in a very vulnerable position. You have to really trust who you're working with. My physical therapists were essential through this process. Hands down, I would not be where I am today without them. They were able to push me to a point where I wouldn't be able to push myself as, as an individual. You know, I will be completely honest, there were nights where I cried myself to sleep because it was so hard. But you're never alone. There's always someone there who'd be willing to help you, who wants to help you. I really believe I was put on this planet to play soccer, so when I'm playing, it's, it's like nothing else in the world exists. Now when I play, it's and, you know, I'm not playing necessarily just for Joe, I'm playing for everyone who's been through this with me. And then my last and perhaps favorite example is this delightful pair of a physical therapist and a patient. Um, so he'll introduce the situation in the video, but essentially um, he was working with her after she broke her hip and she was actually a professional tap dancer and teacher and uh, they did, had their final session with a tap dance that they did together. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Listener. I'm a physical therapist and this is my lovely 95 year old patient Dorothy, also my best friend, <laughs> and also, Dorothy, his, also his dance teacher. <laughs> I'm Dorothy, and we're a very good pair because he loves to dance, and I've danced all my life, and so I have a lot of a lot of steps to give to him. Yes. Okay. And we've been incorporating physical therapy treatments because w to help Dorothy heal her broken left hip and surprisingly we were also able to incorporate dance moves to help with her balance coordination strength agility yes. etc okay. so she's been doing great and here's what we've been up to
That was a long dance that that obviously incredible that that she completed, but kind of also incredible that he completed. I'm sure he had to practice a lot on his own to do that. Um, so um that concludes what I've got to say about movement as medicine. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you all for listening. And um, please enjoy this picture of me many moons ago when I was the face of the t-shirt of dance at the Claremont Colleges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. That was wonderful and really inspiring examples as well. And I appreciate that we're coming back home to this picture of you <laughs> as well as our ending slide. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so we already have a question. Um, it's in the Q&A and I, I'll read it out loud. Um, oh, great. Can you talk about dance movement uh, therapy and various practices like Tai Chi or martial arts? Are they all versions of dance movement therapy or different because some focus on rigidity and precision? Yeah, great question, Corey. Thank you. Um, so dance movement therapy is I think it's easy to throw out any term physical therapy, exercise therapy, dance movement therapy, and talk about that interchangeably with when we practice some of those things independently. Um, so important distinction is that dance movement therapy is a profession and it is, it's a master's program. And so dance movement therapy is only occurring in the context of working with that professional. Um, though I'm sure, you know, they get a lot of questions, I'm sure, about the name dance movement therapist. And I, I don't believe that dance is always a necessary part of it. I think other movement mod modalities could be included. Um, and then just to touch on, you know, martial arts, Tai Chi, Qigong, things like that, those are all um, sort of their own separate entities, but they they do have a lot of crossover with dance um, in particular, as far as being um, something that could be seen as expressive, um, but requires like, a physical ability. So it's sort of this um, crossover between you know athletics or sports um, and and you know other arts. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Alyssa. Yeah, I was just thinking that we have a lot of animal moves too that are in uh, like dance and Tai Chi and uh, yoga. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the next question is first acknowledging a wonderful presentation. And this is something I also wonder, um, as this person is a psychotherapist, how might they think about integrating dance movement therapy into treatment when and to whom to refer clients and which clients? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's a great question. I'll, I'll do my best to answer without overstepping my own bounds because I'm not a dance movement therapist. Um, I, though I learned in researching for this presentation that there is an, an American 
Dance and Movement Therapy Association, much like an American Physical Therapy Association. And so I would imagine there's some great like public access resources for um, people to understand who would benefit from that. Um, my understanding is that it is largely patients and clients who would be coming to see somebody like you as a psychotherapist with more along the mental and emotional health spectrum. Um, I think it's used a lot with children and adolescents, um, though it definitely does not exclude adults by any means. And I would also imagine that um, body-centered diagnoses such as eating disorders would be particularly, um, you know, kind of perfect clients for dance movement therapy. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question as best as I can, being, not being, uh, although I did consider it, <laughs> I do have a friend who is a dance movement therapist. Yeah, I really appreciate the example narrative that you shared where it talked about her getting very like hyper focused and rigid, you know, and kind of getting more and more mm -hmm. down and then um, having dance to kind of feel her space around her so that she could expand perspectives. And oftentimes, I think in psychotherapy, that's um, one of our goals is to expand self awareness and come back home to authentic self. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and for anybody who's struggling with internalization of anything, I would imagine that dance movement therapy would be a wonderful modality to be explored because it is, as the speaker said, is, is a way to um, externalize your internal world. world. Yeah, and um, I had a question about being over zoomed in and in boxes, like literally we're in boxes right now and we had like quarantine and I'm wondering about um, like the ergonomic effects of that. And cause you mentioned, you know, personally, going oh my God, <laughs> this, yeah. if you had any tips there. Yeah, um, some of the things I've been discussing with patients <clears throat> include trying to simulate normalcy in your daily movement profile. So a lot of us, you know, we realize the everything from gyms closing to not wanting to go outside to do anything to realizing how few steps we're getting because we're not commuting. And I think our, our first reaction is to try to make up for that by, and I, I did this myself as well, like, okay, well, on a typical day pre-COVID, I would get 8,000 steps just in my normal day, including my commute. And so I'm just going to go for a really long walk every day and get those steps. And that'll be the same thing when it's a good start, but it's really not. So trying to mimic your usual day as much as you can. So go for a morning walk. That's like your old commute, get up, uh, away from your desk as much as you would if you were going to meetings, going to talk to a coworker, going to the bathroom, going to lunch, and then go for your short evening walk, just like you would for your commute. Um, so trying to mimic that normalcy, it sounds a little bit maddening, but that really would be the closest thing to being able to really try to cope with with uh, the last 15 months of challenge. <laughs> yeah, and I, I really appreciate like there's some kind of structure coming back to that because be because we've been in such this, um, in this like up in the air, uncertain kind of yeah. um, phase where I think it manifests in our body as well as- um, that Undoubtedly. Of, that social Undoubtedly. anxiety uh, mentioned where you said that, you know, like the body caves in. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of becomes like an armadillo, like just like uh, <laughs> protecting vital organs. Mm -hmm. I've seen that a lot. So absolutely. Um, yeah, we have a question on Laban movements used mm -hmm. in Parkinson's patients. And if so, that's, that's a great question. Um, I do not know the answer to that. Uh, I would imagine that, well, so I know that dance has been studied for Parkinson's patients as a, as a treatment modality, as a benefit. And it is well established that exercise is one of the frontline treatments at any stage of Parkinson's disease. So um, I, I, would, I would imagine somebody somewhere has probably done that. I think that would be very interesting to look at because one of the things I didn't really talk about is that Laban movement analysis has a component of it called Laban notation. And it's a way to actually document movement using these symbols. And so it would be interesting to look at, but no, I don't know specifically. 
I imagine it would also help with some kind of expression for it when in Parkinson's, a lot of times, like, you know, it's characteristic, the mass faces and micro. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is something called um, Parkinson's wellness and recovery program. And it's, it's another, it's a framework that there are these standardized sets of exercises that I bet there's a lot of crossover between some of the lob on exercises and those exercises in terms of people with Parkinson's often struggle. Yes. Expression is a big deal, both on the face and with the body, but also being able to reach into far reach space um, and move, um, move directly. If somebody's experiencing tremors, so that's a really interesting idea. Thank you. And uh, here's another question. As an elder, feels like walking in is the de facto movement for a lot of us. <laughs> Are there websites or programs you recommend to get us moving more fully, perhaps when we're walking? This is very, very, very true. Um, uh, yeah. So websites or programs to get us moving more fully. Um, you know, that's a hard question to answer because without kind of knowing anything about the person or who we're talking about, but I would say in general, anything that fits in the category of aerobics or calisthenics, um, you know, aerobics and calisthenics are forms of exercise that generally do involve moving all the limbs and moving the body in all directions. And there are a lot of, um, options for those things. Often when we think of aerobics and calisthenics, we think of, you know, somebody in spandex who's flying around the room and like, oh, I can't do that. Um, so things like sit and be fit and other um, aerobics or calisthenics seated videos can be a great way to focus kind of on the waist up um, in order to move, you know, the kind of the parts of you that don't move as much when you're walking. And, um, you know, never knock uh, swimming and water exercise as well, because that can be a great way to get the arms involved a bit more biking. Um, you know, any, any of those forms of cardio, I think are, are equally viable and they can be modified in a way that makes it a, attainable and safe for you. And I'm just wondering, um, are there common questions you get as a physical therapist, uh, just like for anyone who hasn't seen a physical therapist before, like their first yes. level, level concerns? And <laughs> yeah, yes, this is my opportunity <laughs> to clarify. Um, yeah, so I get, um, you know, often I get questions about how we are different from like a personal trainer or a massage therapist or a chiropractor. And, you know, I think maybe the most overlap is probably with a chiropractor, um, especially in terms of the level of education that we have. So physical therapy is a doctoral level education. It's um, three years after your undergrad degree. It involves essentially the same prerequisites as a med student. Um, it's three calendar years, so 36 months of training. Um, there's, you know, a doctoral level research project. So it's, it's really set up to be an autonomous practitioner. So I think that's one thing that's important to understand is that um, it, now in all 50 states, a person can go and see a physical therapist without a physician's referral or without being, you know, monitored or overseen by a physician. So um, that, that's a pretty huge difference between us. And, and a lot of other um, professions, you know, physical therapy. The one thing I think I would love to share with everybody is that if you've had a negative experience in physical therapy, um, you know, there are poor fits and poor practitioners, unfortunately, in every profession. And I hope that people who have had negative experiences can try to remain open-minded to the profession as a whole, because our profession has changed so significantly over the last 50 years, and even more so in the last 20 years. And there is, is such a variety in how physical therapists approach um, working with somebody. And so I think it's always good to talk to a physical therapist about, you know, well, what's the end game here? What's the goal? 
what is this going to involve? What is this going to look like? And that might be different from provider to provider. And if you don't feel like that's going to be a good fit for you, it's always okay to um, look elsewhere because the profession is vast and this person should be able to partner with you to help you achieve the things that are important to you. Yeah, I have to just say that shares a lot of integrative medicine tenets of um, really partnering with patients and yeah. sure that it's personalized as well. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and recognizing fit, you know, just uh, we bring one person to another person. They just may have different life experiences that uh, doesn't resonate. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, here's another question. How do you approach balancing someone pushing their physical limits and avoiding injury while exercising? Yeah, great question. Um, and this also resonates with the fit idea between you and your provider. Um, of course, none of us ever have the intention of guiding someone towards more injury. That's the exact opposite of what we want. Um, a lot of the things I talk to people about are um, descriptions of how to develop the body awareness to determine if what you are doing is crossing the line from challenging yourself for growth over into risking injury. So, of course, we're always talking about your proper form, proper parameters, stick to the plan we made for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, but within that, developing the body awareness to determine, does this feel like um, it's hurting in the sense that my muscles are working really hard and I'm exhausted? Or does this feel like I'm hurting in terms of I am teetering towards injuring myself? So strategies to develop that awareness for yourself are really important. Um, you know, there, there are some hard and fast rules I can set with somebody such as you're only allowed to have one more point from zero to 10 in pain during your exercise before it's too much, right? Or you're only allowed to, if I tell you to do three sets of 12, if you feel okay, you can do three sets of 15, but you can't do three sets of 20. So helping people establish boundaries when body awareness is going to be challenging to figure out. And then always, always, always going gradually. Yeah, I have to say, you know, I'm coming from the mind side, although I feel like there's no split of mind and body. And that re resonates deeply about not going too far into the overload, you know, injury zone, as opposed to the kind of that growth zone and being mindful of it. Um, so yeah. And when I talk to somebody about their history with exercise and sports, um, you know, a good PT or any rehabilitation practitioner can get an idea for if, if this is somebody who has a tendency to push that way or the opposite, somebody who has a tendency to be overly cautious and, maybe have some of what we call kinesiophobia or fear of movement. So most people fall somewhere in the middle, but there are people that I will not give those general guidelines and I will either abandon those completely because I see that they're not, they're really not pushing themselves to the point where they're going to be able to make change, or I'm going to dial it back a lot and have really, really strict rules about what they can and can't do. You're really helping them with their boundaries if they're like tiger parenting themselves to like that <laughs> next bar. So really. Yeah. Um, and here's another question. Are you optimistic the U.S. population is on a course to be better fit? Feels like the last few generations were victimized by parts of the food industry, more sedentary screen time and reliance on medicine for mm -hmm. health. And, you know, I guess the pandemic doesn't really help all this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're so right about how the food industry has developed, um, how much we rely on technology. Um, although I would say technology is both good and bad for health. Um, I think the, the things that I'm optimistic about um, are generations probably, well, don't quote me on this, but probably starting, I'd say around like Gen X, maybe, I think. 
Exercise is more a part of the lexicon, particularly for women now when it wasn't once part of that. So a lot of the time when I work with some of my boomer and older patients, you know, if unless they got into it at a later age or they were into sports when they were younger, exercise wasn't something that was like part of you know, the, the daily awareness or the public's awareness to do. And so that has developed tremendously as well as just the availability of it with technology, anything from free YouTube videos to apps to, you know, the expensive tech like Peloton bikes and the mirror thing and all that stuff. Um, So I do think that is a huge positive. Um, whereas that wasn't really there before. And my hope is that as we hopefully move away from the negatives of the food industry um, with more of that awareness, that, that the balance of you know, better, better food industry, more public awareness and availability of good food with more awareness about the benefits of exercise um, and encouraging children to be active, I think is a huge huge game changer for when people are adults is whether or not they were involved in something exercise based as a child. Yeah, I really appreciate your kind of wisdom, words of wisdom of planting the seed early or like just finding a pathway that kind of is personalized to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, What dancers were inspiring to you in your career? Oh, thank you for this question. Um, My absolute favorite dancer choreographer is Alvin Ailey. I've seen the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater almost every single year over the last decade. Um, my, for anybody who has a dance background, if there's anybody here with dance background, um, my a majority of my training in college was Horton based uh, modern dance. And so Ailey comes from that background as well. And I just think watching the black joy and black magic is just incredible and the choreography is incredible and it's just always spoke to me on some level so that's that's my absolute most inspiring um uh person in in dance for sure even as you talk about it you know there's this um essence and movement (laughs) (laughs) yeah on a on a uh more relatable level for those of you not that don't know who Alvin Ailey is my other um favorite though perhaps slightly controversial um dance love is Michael Jackson (laughs) Hmm. unparalleled yeah (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah um how how do you use dance in your like day-to-day personal life these days I mean I gave a little clip (laughs) (laughs) yeah um sadly Admittedly, it's been very little part of my day to day. I've I've had a uh, love hate relationship with getting on the virtual exercise train, despite trying to convince other people to do it. I totally understand that it's not the same, and I, for exercise and dance, for myself personally, very much love a class environment, and I've missed that desperately. So I'm very much looking forward to dance, as dance studios open, um, trying to get back into that. So that's, that hasn't been much a part of my, my day to day, um, at least over the last year. Prior to that though, I was generally always involved in something. My, my latest project was, um, finally learning how to tap dance. <laughs> yeah. The way of communication too, just like the, the sounds of the tap. And I, I was really oh, by that video too. Oh and I my like gosh. That she was like, you know, I, I can teach the steps. Like you can learn. <laughs> it's really great when, you know, you can, you can put your patient in charge and they, you know, the amount of confidence in themselves about their movement and their body when you're speaking their language, so to speak, um, is, is really wonderful. Well, I think we're almost at the end here. Any remaining okay. words of wisdom for us, Alyssa? Just keep moving. You're you're never you're never too out of shape or too injured or too old or too ill or too anything. Just keep moving. Do it in ways that bring you joy. That's the most 
the most important part. And when you can't do that because of a physical ail, that's when you come and see us and we'll help you be able to go back to that thing you love. But that's what it's all about. Really, really inspiring last word. So well, thank you again for presenting yes. us. And, um, Pleasure. I just wanted to just, yeah, really appreciate this, this uh, framework that you've provided us. And, Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you.